things would pile up. And then I would get so frustrated that I'd just scoop stuff up and, and take it down to the garbage chute. So I went to see a therapist, and then she says, Mr. Dussolet, have you had any conversations about uh, ADD, ADHD? I said, no, no, I'm, I'm lazy. I want to get myself together. I want to deal with this clutter and stuff. And she asked me some questions, and there was one that had her just like, oh, man, if a person could literally explode, she would have. She said, do you have a problem holding on to small details, something like that? My response was, if I'm interested, hell no. If I'm not interested, hell yes. ADHD Rewired, episode number 46. This is the show designed to help those of us who have really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and consultant. We know that starting can be the hardest part. So let's get started with another episode. But first, let me tell you about this. This podcast is brought to you by Audible. There's a new book that just showed up on Audible that I actually just started that I want to tell you about. It's by Wes Crenshaw, and it's called I Always Want to Be Where I'm Not, Successful Living with ADD and ADHD. I just started this book, and I'm really into it, and I, uh, I really want to encourage you to go check it out. And if you haven't done so already, go listen for free by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. The ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group is about productivity and goal setting and just being more productive, but it's also a lot more than that. And I don't think that I've actually done a really good job to this point at really expressing and sharing with you what it's actually like to be a member of this group. Hello? This is Diane. When she joined the group, her main focus was to organize her life at home and related to her at-home business. Hey, Eric, what's going on? So there were a few things that I wanted to talk to Diane about. There was one main thing in particular, but the first thing that I really wanted to find out from her was just, I wanted her to tell me, to tell you, you know, what she thought about the group and if she thought it was worth it and, you know, what she kind of gained from it. Oh, absolutely. I learned so many skills and strategies that when I started, I did not have a clue. And I came out at the other end with tons of things that I learned and made some great new friends and allies that I truly believe I'll have for the rest of my life. Now, I was looking through the, the end of the group survey, and there was a, a comment that you made regarding something that you would have liked to to kind of see more of and have more of. Can you kind of expound on that a little bit? Yeah, there was one thing that I wish, Eric, you would have included a little more in, in the group, and that was your monkey puppet because <laughs> he was awesome. Every time that you would include him in a little video, I just loved how you spoke to him as though he was real. You were just so sincere, and it, it not only made me laugh, but it just, like, touched that inner child in me that was just, I don't know, it was so validating in a way because you were so sincere and thoughtful towards your monkey puppet. So he's just one of a kind, and I wish you would have had a little more of him in there. Actually, do you remember that one time, like, I think it was after you had posted a, either a picture or a video of your monkey puppet, and, like, all of us posted pictures, of, like, we all had monkeys of some sort, of a, a stuffed monkey, and I was like, oh, this is my monkey. Hey, this is my monkey. And, like, seven pictures of monkeys posted. It was pretty funny. Well, I, I want to I wanna thank you for, for sharing this. Uh... <laughs> You're very, very, very welcome. It was a lot of fun, and I think that was one of the, being in the group really helped me just kind of embrace my inner monkey or inner squirrel or something that this is fun. This is funny. And, you know, just go with it because it's, it's, it's a blast. More of this conversation at the break. Go to ADHDrewired.com and schedule your free consult with me today. This group is filling up and it will sell out. Don't wait. Registration closes Friday, January 15th, 2015. 
Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. I'm glad you're joining us for another episode. My guest today, you may have heard just a teaser of a few episodes ago. Uh, he actually called in to share his story, and his name is Oz Du Soleil, and he just told me a really cool story about his name. And he did ask, you know, he didn't really want to share the story here, but I do have it on the behind the scenes clip that you'll be able to see on my website. So let me tell you a little bit about Oz Du Soleil. So he is a trainer and consultant for anything Microsoft Excel. His mission in life is to rid the world of crap data at the unnecessary misery it causes. The diagnosis of ADHD at the age of 38 provided a meaningful context for a lot of odd situations. I'm sure we'll be hearing about those uh, in this, this uh, interview. Um, how does a person hyper-focus on complicated Excel solutions but regularly fail, fall asleep in movie theaters? ADHD was the place to look for answers. Oz lives in Portland, Oregon, appreciates good bourbon, and is the author of Gorilla Data Analysis, the second edition, co-written with Mr. Excel, Bill Jellin. Is it, did I say his name right? Correct. All right. And you, you actually didn't mention in here, you... you you play bass? Yes, and he, yes. And he plays bass. So, Oz, welcome to ADHD Rewired. Thanks, thanks. Glad to be here. What, what did I leave out in the intro? Did you leave out? Oh, what, what, what did you wish I left out? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't wish you wish you left out anything. No, I, um, I appreciate hats, and I have several custom-made hats, including a cowboy hat. And um, I just turned 50 last September, never been married, no kids. And how does this all tie together? It ties together because I'm just too much of a cowboy. You know, I uh, was living in Chicago for 19 years. And last August, just a few months ago, I got in my car with the stuff that would fit in it. And I drove from Chicago to Portland, Oregon, 16 days. Just, it was just a beautiful, beautiful experience. I felt so blessed. And that's why I, I have tried this relationship thing and it's not worked and uh, no, no kids, no wife, no girlfriend, just me, like the tumbleweeds I saw in Wyoming. <laughs> now, what, what kind of car did you take this trip in? A 1997 Geo Tracker. It was the car when I went shopping. I did not want a car note. I wanted a car I could pay cash for. Hmm. Yes. So was this a, was this a trip that was planned, or was this kind of like a, I'm out of here? It was. Well, it was. Um, it was a dream that was five years old, right? And it never faded. I mean, just almost weekly, if not daily, there was, I'm moving to Portland, but there was never a when or a how or what I needed to make it happen. And then finally, last November, November uh, 2013, I said, you know, something's got to be different and then I started looking at a future and I said, okay, it's time to knock the dust off of this Portland dream and put that in my future. And so then um, that was the decision is sometime by the end of the summer, I'm moving to Portland. And then there was a moment where say, you know, maybe three, four months later, I had not done anything to make Portland happen so I said, okay, I'm going to start throwing stuff out and taking stuff to the alley. And that was the first gesture that then started the momentum that made Portland real. So it was that first step, like, wait, I'm taking this stuff out the door. Why don't I just put it in the car? Is no, that... no, no, no. My, oh, what I mean by the alley, um, throwing stuff out that I was not going to keep and was not going to Portland with me. Oh, okay. Okay. And what what was your draw to go to Portland? Um, I had a moment where I had to go train some people up in Wisconsin. And after my second trip up there, I found myself not wanting to come back to Chicago. Uh, and I had no idea, but it was, you know, 
going downtown and being able to park in La Crosse, Wisconsin, striking up conversations with strangers at the, in a tea aisle at the grocery store. So, wow, okay, I no longer need the intensity and the pace. So, but La Crosse was too remote. Where could I find a real city that had that small town feel? And um, Portland came up and uh, Texas came, uh, Austin, Texas. And I went with Portland. Um, there's minimal risk of running into Carl Rove or George Bush down there. <laughs> I mean, in, in Portland, you know, you know so that, that, that would have been a, a, a bad thing. Um, but, but seriously, I visited Portland and I said, yeah, yeah, I, I could come back here. So now that you're, you're out in Portland and you know, just describe to me kind of your, the community that you live in and then a little bit about your work. Okay. Um, right now I'm living in a, uh, suburb Milwaukee, um, I was, I arranged a living situation before I left Chicago and found this great person who was willing to rent me a room month to month. And so now I'm sorting out and creating a new um, social life and everything here in Portland. Um, but it's great. I love going out, the, the food carts, the people are great. Um, it's a whole different experience of all the trees and the driving up hills and down hills and the twisty roads. Very different from driving on a grid in Chicago. Well, that uphill and downhill and twisty roads sounds probably a little bit up like the history of your life. Mm hmm. Yeah. So let's, yep. let's let's go down those those some of those roads a little bit. Mm hmm. So you were you said you were diagnosed with ADHD at 38 years old and you're mm -hmm. now 50. So what, what was it that brought you to that diagnosis? There was things that were just not right um, in my life. So I went to a therapist to see, you know, why can't I get myself together? There are things that I can focus on and dig into and become a minor expert in things. And But then there are other things that, that don't happen. Um, you know, I, I started playing bass around uh, 38 years old as well. And, oh, man, I dug into theory. I took classes. I did a lot of things. But then... And if you're playing bass, you met Helena Boucher, right? Yep. Was a yep. prior guest on this show. Yep, yep. She's great. Um, so, but learning songs was hard for mm -hmm. me. Um, what part of What part of the learning songs was hard? Memorizing song arrangements, memorizing chord progressions, anything that was just straight out memorization. Mm -hmm. That was difficult and learning it on the spot, being mm -hmm. in classes and then they say, OK, we're going to learn this song. All right. And it starts in F sharp. OK, F sharp. I got it. Minor or major. OK, minor. All right. F sharp. Minor. OK. And then we're going to go to uh, B from there. OK, we're going to go to B. All right. Um, then there's no, 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 no. We're going to walk to the B. OK, F sharp minor. I'm going to walk to the B. All of this stuff is going on in my head, and I'm trying to figure out what else is happening with the band and how many measures of what are we doing. Is it one measure of each or is it half measures? What's going on here? All of this stuff starts firing in my head, and it makes it just doggone hard. So what would you do? I started to write things down, and then I developed a system for myself in Excel to put these songs on a grid. And so it's funny because people that, that know me, especially uh, you know, the, the members of the, the uh, my last coaching group, know that when it comes to Excel, my eyes just go, go kind of, they kind of glaze over. Mm -hmm. I, I, I see the value of it. I just, it yeah. hurts my brain. So when, uh -huh. I, when I heard from you and you're like, you're the, you're the Excel wizard. It's like, how? Tell me, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> like I, I'm I'm a mind map thinker. Like I'm kind yeah. of I I have you know ideas that are connected, mm -hmm. and Excel just seems so linear to me. Mm -hmm. So, right. okay, before we kind of go into to that tangent, right. I want to I want to hear a little bit more about 
uh, the, the process of getting diagnosed. Okay. All right. So, um, so anyway, so there was, um, things that, uh, just weren't getting done in my life and, and the song songs are not a good example, but, um, just, uh, what, like, like dealing with clutter, Mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, papers and just things would pile up and then I would get so frustrated that I just scoop stuff up and, and take it down to the garbage chute. Um, that's, that's one method. Yeah, that's one <laughs> method, but it wasn't the one that I liked. It wasn't one where I felt like I was really in control. Yeah. So, so I could dig and probe into base or wine or bourbon or whatever it is. But meanwhile, I'm living in all this clutter that I eventually get fed up with and throw out. Um, so I went to see a therapist and then she says, uh, um, Mr. Dussolet, have you had any conversations about uh, ADD, ADHD? I said, no, no, I'm, I'm lazy. I want to get myself together. I want to deal with this clutter and stuff. Um, and she asked me some questions and there was one that had her just like, oh man, if a person could literally explode, she would have. She said, do you have a problem holding on to small details, something like that? Uh-huh. And I t- and my, lang- my, my response was, if I'm interested, hell no. If I am interested, if I'm not interested, hell yes. And that began, she, yeah, she's heard that, heard how I peeled it apart. Yeah and was able to answer it. So she was like, oh my gosh. Okay, so we should at least try. Wait, so but, I, she probably like, was reaching for a stamp, certified ADHD. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that that started it. And then she said, let's at least try some medication. So I don't remember what the original was, but I could feel myself come out of a fog I never knew I was in. Mm, mm. And that's, and, that's so powerful yeah. and, and so relatable too. And I, I was actually just talking with someone else uh, earlier today um, about that experience of, of feeling normal for the first time when you started mm. that medication. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yeah, and then, you know, you can get into questions about, you know, what is normal, but <laughs> I, I liked coming out of the clouds and seeing what was there, you know, um, and then I've talked with friends and mentioned that um, it, it, it was way later mentioned that I was taking Adderall. And then one friend said that she and her friends used to snort it so mm-hmm. they could party all weekend. And then another friend said that he and his friends used to get Adderall and um, stay up all weekend to study for finals. And they're, I said they were well, abusing that stuff. R- right. And and so it that made no sense to me. Because when I take my my medication, I don't feel all buzzed and ready to party. I just come out of a fog, you know. So eventually, I got, you know, I, I switched therapists and got with somebody that I stayed with for quite a few years, and um, he explained that that is one way of recognizing ADHD or not. Well, it, you know, it, here's the thing, and, and uh, someone actually recently. Um, brought this up in the uh, ADHD rewired community Facebook group. Mm -hmm. And it's, it used to be thought it used to be kind of a, one of the uh, kind of benchmarks of, okay, how do we test to see if this, this diagnosis is accurate is to give a medication. And that's actually a very old kind of thinking and outdated thinking. And the reason is, uh, is because most people are going to perform better on a stimulant medication. Okay. So it's not really a valid, uh, uh, mechanism for verifying uh the adhd Mm -hmm. okay okay all right so can you speak at all to why i've never felt buzzed at all versus my friends who abused it right because you know you you are you're being treated optimally with with the medication i'm not saying that that it's 
what people will do better on on stimulants they'll be able to perform better just like you can perform better you're, you're performing the way your brain is kind of supposed to perform where other people who who are not prescribed it and take it are going to they're using it as a performance enhancement mm, okay mm, mm-hmm. um and you know just to really be uh, just to put this message out there you know as as someone with adhd who takes medication and this is a, a very common issue um we're you know, regarding uh, medication is that, you know, the, the abuse of, of stimulant medication on, uh, especially on college campuses, um, you know, one, it's, yes, it's a problem Two, I don't think it's as prevalent as people think it is, but for people who have ADHD, I cannot in, in really encourage you enough. Do not tell your friends you have ADHD and lock up your medication. Okay, mm-hmm. because you know when when you're a student, you know most students are poor, and you know it'd be nice to have some, a couple extra bucks in in your wallet to to go do some things you want to do. Don't just put that out of your mind as an as an option for you, um, because it makes you know because the real challenge is because of that is it's really hard to get our medication. You know we yes. have to jump through all of these these hurdles and hoops. You know we have to remember to to contact our doctor with enough time before our medication runs out. We have to go pick it up because you know they're afraid that we're going to be you know misusing or abusing it. We can't have them call it in. So all these things, task initiation, planning, organizing, sequencing, time management are all the reasons we need the medication, Mm -hmm. but are all things we need to do in order to get our medication. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is, is because of the, you know, the the abuse of of this medication. So please, you know, if if you take medication, um, you know, be responsible with it. Don't share it because it makes it harder for all of us who, who need it. Yep. Yep. That's right. That's right. All right. I am now stepping off my pedestal. Hey, (laughs) it's all right. Need to be said. You know, it's it's an important issue. Cause I feel it's it's truly no like the fact that I can't just call my doctor and have him just call it into the pharmacy or have it just automatically refilled like I can with any other medication. Right. To me, it doesn't feel any different than a, a person who is in a in a wheelchair. You know, they can they have a ramp. They can get into the building. You know, it's it's it, so it's it to me it feels in a lot of ways very discriminating. And I think we need better responses to dealing with medication diversion uh, than just making all these restrictions because it makes it harder for, for all of us who need the treatment and need the medication to get that treatment. Yeah. And you know, something you, you raised something I, I hadn't thought about is um, I had a doctor and I had to go in and I think pay $80 a visit for the 15 minutes to go get a prescription. Right. Because there are no refills, none. So, you know, yeah, I had to make an appointment, uh, I think every 60 days, something like that, mm-hmm. you know, pay the 80 bucks to sit there 15 minutes and get a prescription written. Yeah. And I know a lot of doctors who are, are comfortable prescribing it, who are, you're not working with a, a new patient, but someone who they've been familiar with for a while. They, and the laws of are in some states are getting a little bit more flexible where they're allowing doctors to write several kind of months worth at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I you know I think it, the doctor has to use good judgment, but I think that a lot of doctors are afraid to prescribe it because mm-hmm. they, they don't know how to do it correctly. Mm, mm, okay. You know, I saw a uh, a meme uh, from uh, the, um, Rick Green, who does a totally ADD. Um, you know, that he's the guy that did the um, uh, ADD and loving it and ADD and mastering it, the PBS documentaries. Okay. And uh, yeah, this this funny meme was it was of him and uh, and the guy that did the documentary with kind of making a sort of a goofy face, and um, the the capture the caption on it said something like, why is it that we know way more about ADHD than your doctor? Oh, and it's true. Oh. It's true. You know, it's like, you know, the doctors are, are, are unfortunately very ill-equipped uh, to, to treat ADHD because they don't get the training in it. And, you know, mm. but it's, it's unfortunate because it's an extraordinarily treatable disorder. Um, mm-hmm. So tell me a little bit more about some of the kind of the, the catalysts that brought you into to seek that evaluation and get the diagnosis. What else was going on in your life? Um, getting sucked into just you know, just easily getting sucked into certain things. Um, what were what some of the I challenges? Think? What were some of the the hurdles? The road? The the did you ever kind of hit have that moment where you literally ran into that brick wall and just kind of 
where they're, you know, in pain, like something is not right. Like, why do I keep screwing up? Why, you know, have you had those kinds of experiences? Um, I don't, I don't, I can't recall a, a brick wall, but just, um, I could get fascinated with things and then spend hours and be up all night researching something that didn't have much relevance on anything that, that I was up to in life. Um, what can I say? Um, what about, Oz, what about your, t- you, you, you had shared with me before that you were, uh, you, you spent some time in the Navy, right? Yeah. Could you yeah. tell us about that? Okay. Um, I feel like, I was dealing with ADHD when I was in nuclear power school, right? There was a series of things I went through there over a few years and just got screamed at, you know, so nuclear power school. Okay. So I uh, had to test to get in and I scored high on the test, which means that I was accepted into the program and I didn't have to go through the eight week preschool. I was able to go to the four week preschool. And so then I finally get into the actual uh, nuclear power uh, training and I'm falling asleep in the class. And I'm really, this is stuff that I know, you know, and so I'm falling asleep in the class and then I'm constantly in trouble. They're screaming at me in front of everybody and tell me, go stand up in the back of the room if I can't stay awake. And then the threats. That could be a good strategy, actually. Well, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it, it it can be. It can be, you know, but then, you know, what's on my mind is I'm standing in the back of the room wondering what's wrong with me. Mm-hmm. Why can't I stay awake? You know, I'm no longer am I really there present thinking mm-hmm. about the material. Um, I'm thinking about staying in more trouble and then the threats to kick me out of the program, even, even though, you know, I'm standing, you know, but passing exams and stuff. Um you know, and it's, did you get enough sleep? Why Why are you staying up all night? Well, I didn't stay up all night. I did go to sleep. And you know, why? what's the problem with you sleeping in class? Well, now I can get a sense of why I've had girlfriends complain because I went to sleep in a movie theater. And they're just sitting there. I'm just sitting yeah, for your, hours. Your brain just kind of shuts down when you're bored. Yeah. And so then in a movie theater, you know, getting up and walking around in, in an option like it is at home, you know, it should, and, be. <laughs> it should be, it should, you know, like those places that have somebody come around and offer you pizza or, or wine or yeah. something. It's some kind of other things going on than just sitting and looking. Um, that, yeah. So nuclear power school was rough because I mean, you're talking of, about like nuclear, like engineering, right? Yes, yes, yes. You, you got to have some brains for that. I mean, I, right. I had a uh, one of my my cousins who uh, um, did know, like four or five, six years in the Navy. It was mm-hmm. in the the nuclear engineering uh, program, and, and you know he he went there because he was he got himself in a whole lot of trouble uh, at, at school, and he decided to you know straighten his act out that way. And he really did. I mean, he's he was you know really excelled at everything he did, and it was pretty impressive. I mean, nuclear engineering is not for the faint of heart. I mean. That's that, that's that's some real kind of intellectual stuff. It's a lot. It's a lot because you, you're thinking about the nuclear power plant, uh, the cooling systems, emergency cooling systems, hydraulics, heat transfer and fluid flow. So um, the electronic aspects of it, the backups, what if the electric electronics fails, where are the hydraulic backups and, and what's designed to just plain shut down if such and such happens. Yeah, so yeah, so there's a lot involved there. And um, eventually I did fail out of the program and you know, it's embarrassing to to say that. But what'd you learn from that though? What um from the experience itself? Either at that time or looking back now, because I think that, you know, I I really believe strongly in the idea of failing forward and that when we have these these 
screw ups when things don't go the way we wanted them to go. If we can gain something, whether it's a lesson, something valuable from that, then you know what? It's that's tuition. That's that's the, yeah. the tuition of life where we learn those uh, from those experiences and mm -hmm. do not not view that as something to be embarrassed about. Okay. But look at that as I didn't know that about myself at that point. Right. And here's what I learned about myself because of that. And if it weren't for that, I probably wouldn't be where I am now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing is I had to get to a place to where I just had to own it, yeah. you know, that that. You know, I failed out of um, week 19, I think, of a 24-week program. I don't know. You, you asked me a good question with that one because, you know, I, I knew the material. I knew the material, but eventually um, didn't pass enough exams in, in the right courses to stay in the program. Um, and just owning that, telling the truth about it. Yeah. Um, and then now feeling some kind of, you know, like the, with the ADD diagnosis and really believing and not trying to pull the ADHD card, right? No, I, that's that's a very hard one for, for me to do because, you know, I don't want to tell a girlfriend, look, I fell asleep because I got ADHD. No, I'm not going to play that game. Um, I just, you know, I have had to own that I don't like sitting in movie theaters. I, and and that's okay. Well, I, think it's, I think it's okay to use it as an explanation, not an excuse. You know, right. it's like when you say, you know, I. It's not that I don't want to spend time with you. It's like just my, the way my brain is. Like if I'm in a movie, especially if I'm, it's not capturing my attention. Mm -hmm. My brain just shuts down. It's like it's yeah, it's part of having ADHD, but it's you know, it's it, it is what it is. Um, but so yeah. I think owning it, not using it as an excuse. Yes. Um, you know, you could, you could say, you know, I'll go to a movie with you if you can find one of those that they serve pizza and beer. Uh, right, right, right. <laughs> right. Uh, something, you know, something that re is really, really captivating to me. Um, but looking back at nuclear power school, um, I guess, you know, it could give me an idea about if I had to do something like that again, how could I make it work? rather than just take the scream in and and try better try harder yeah. you know yeah. there is i am know, sure that you were trying as, as oh. hard as you could yeah yeah and then now i recognize that you know there are some days where i leave home i haven't taken my medicine and then i'm out it's 11 o'clock in the morning and i am deep in the fog and i i know what's going on and you know i know what's mm -hmm. happening that um um, I don't, you know, beat on myself or wonder what the heck is wrong with me, you know. Uh, something that I, a, a quick kind of uh, just idea about that, um, something that, that I do is I will have in a, a few different places that I go is I have an emergency pill. Um, yes. You know, where it's like you can keep one in the car. Um, you know, I my, my wife usually carries, you know, yes, that's illegal, um, but... She she has one you know on her just in you know just in case, um, mm -hmm. you know it's I have this like, completely irrational fear of being like stranded on a desert island, even though I live in the Chicago area, um, without my medication and being stuck there for the rest of my life because I can't organize myself to get off that island. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, now, that, you know, that, that now that mess. we're thinking about getting our stuff organized to kind of move forward, what I want to do first is take a quick break. And then I want to come back and talk to you a bit about Excel and kind of the way you're the genius of your brain and some of the things that, that you're doing and how you're leveraging ADHD as a strength versus as a, a challenge for you. So we'll be right back. Remember Diane from earlier in the show? I'm going to talk to her again here in just a second. And I first asked her about if she is maintaining the progress she's made. And then she shares what it was like to be an accountability partner with me. And it involves mayonnaise. I, you know, I think I am maintaining some very essential parts, such as the making my list the night before, mm -hmm. which made a really big difference for me. I am still um, APing. Let me just jump in there really quickly. APing is the act of being an accountability partner with somebody. I am still um, APing with actually one of the people from the group. Are you really? That's awesome. Mostly, yeah, yeah. And um, so just that constant support. And without that, I might have really dropped off the face of the earth. I don't know. But, you know, that's the, one of the, the really wonderful parts about the group was 
just the support that was non-judgmental. You know, okay, you got stuck at the office and, you know, you and I happened to be APing a couple times when that happened. And, you know, there was no judgment or like, you know, it's not like I'm sitting here thinking, oh, this is our leader. And, you know, he's not setting a good example. It's not that at all. It's like, I totally get it. You know, it's like, sure, you know, go home or how can I support you? Or, hey, let's race. You know, we that was actually race each really, other, I, our I teeth, remember you know? that. That was extraordinarily <laughs> helpful, the, the race. That was. That was very motivating. <laughs> and the, I think you threatened me with what was it? Um, a spoonful of of um, of mayo, oh, yes, oh. mayonnaise. Because <laughs> you hate mayonnaise for some reason. I, that got you home very quickly. I, I agree to do it. I agree to do a video of a eating a yeah. spoonful of mayonnaise if I if, if you beat me. <laughs> yep. And oh, I was oh, I was racing so fast, and you beat me by like one <laughs> second. I sat down in my bed, and I was like, I'm like typing in, and boop, there came your little picture. I'm like, oh man, I really wanted to make you do that. I just want to thank Diane again for allowing me to record this call to share with you, guys. The ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group is set to begin next Monday, January nineteenth, two thousand fifteen. If you did not get an email from me and you were listening to this on the morning it airs, I will be hosting a free live webinar on Monday at 1 p.m. Central Time. I will be presenting Productivity 2.0, Smart Tools, and Smarter Apps for Getting Things Done with ADHD. You can register at my website, ADHDrewired.com. For anyone who attends this live webinar, you're going to get the chance to sign up for this group for $200 off the full registration. You do have to attend live and schedule your screening call within one hour of this webinar ending to get this discounted rate, $699. This program, these three months of intensive coaching, is valued at $3,800, which is why I'm excited to make it available to be able to fit most budgets. You can split it up in four payments of $299 or for the best value, just do it all at once. It's only $899. All of this information is spelled out at my website, and I can answer any of your questions when you schedule that free consultation with me. This is the last time you're going to be hearing me talk about this group. It starts next week. Go to ADHDrewired.com and prepare to get your ADHD rewired. Now I still have a lot to do. So, back to the show. All right, Oz, we are back and we are uh, going to dive in to how you are now using kind of part of how your brain works and doing things that just makes my head spin. And we're going to talk a little bit about Excel. And I f- have a feeling you might be the only person who might make Excel kind of sound interesting. Maybe oh, even cool oh yeah it is all right tell tell us about that turn us on to excel okay well excel it started for me when all these customers would call where i was working and there would be these complaints they would call in to complain about stuff and i would ask the people along the process you know internally you know about grading and 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 customer service and um uh billing all the, you know, classroom ops. I'd ask questions and everybody was doing what they supposed to do. They cared. They were putting in the effort. And then I realized the data's jacked up. (laughs) So I would look and I'd see, okay, I see what went wrong. You have four profiles in the system and three of them um, are complete. And then there's this fourth incomplete one where is the thing that we needed and have you had you fall out of the process okay so then i learned how to clean stuff up in service to these people right but i didn't realize that i was doing something hard i felt like these were fun challenges in service of people who had high stakes Hmm. you know some people were getting termination notices that should have gone to somebody else Hmm. you know and it was the that, data that was high stakes. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, I just, you know, I had a, a director. He was just the most wonderful person. And I, I thank him in my book because he saw that I had this analytical skill 
that he lacked. He was a people person. So mm -hmm. he brought me on as his right hand man, his data guy. And we set out to fix things, to dig into, are we charging too little for shipping? Um, so can you get me this data? So I'd get the data and then we could make some decisions. You know, how is the uh, customer service department performing when we could look and get all this data? So I just fell in love with, with using data <laughs> and what we could find out about our world, right? Um, and then, you know, being able to use Excel to organize my song arrangements and when I would have a band leader who refused to write things down, okay, I'll write this stuff down. All right. So I write it down and then I began to see the patterns in how the song hung together and then see the, the weird things. Like maybe there was some one bar interlude that they'd never highlighted for me. Okay. And that's why every time we came out of this chorus, the second time I was off. Now we we can see here's four bars, here's eight bars here, and those second four are repeat of the first four. And then here's this uh, chorus, and then this, and then here's the chorus again, and here's this one bar interlude, and then we're back into the verse again. Okay, so being able to put it on a grid, I could see. Um, with Excel, um, we can just, so one thing that I created was called a naughty niceometer. Just a <laughs> playful, Tell us about that. Yeah, a playful thing using Excel where you can set up for kids um, and have a, like a menu of activities that are either naughty or nice and their point values, right? So lying could be negative 100 helping your sibling with the homework can be positive 30, whatever. And so, you so you're keep using this for some like behavioral metrics. Yes. Yes. So by Christmas time, you know, if you're going to see Santa or if you're going to see Krampus, <laughs> right. Right. And, and Excel I mean, is, you, you've yeah. got this like very subtle, but really funny sense of humor. And I, oh, okay. I, I, I <laughs> It, oh. It's funny because you're you're clearly this very analytical person, but it's yeah. like so when you throw me those curveballs, it's like it just cracks me up. I love right, it. Right, right, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so that's this is where you know, um, working with Excel isn't this linear thing. It's like let's have some fun with this, you know. And so with the naughty niceometer, there's a picture that that based on the values, if it's zero or above, there's a picture of Santa. If it's uh, below zero, there's a picture of Krampus. And as a kid, so if a kid is um, positive 10, there's Santa. And if they say, okay, you told a lie, now boop, now you're negative 90 and the picture automatically changes to Krampus, right? And it shows these are the number of days until Christmas. So you're negative 90, you have this many days to turn that around or you better get ready for his his birch branches because you're gonna, you're gonna get a I, spanking. How, how does someone how does someone get a hold of something like this is this something yeah. that you've created or is this something that you did like for for commercial uh use or is this just something you created no it's um i've written a blog post about it i've done a couple of videos on youtube and i believe it's on my website to download if not I can provide a link Please um, do. with yeah for for uh your viewers. Um so and my my uh website is datascopic.net but you know we can put a link for that as well. Absolutely. But but where Excel is exciting is really having control over your world because everything is data. Give us some real practical for people who aren't doing these huge kind of analytic projects that you're doing. How mm -hmm. could someone in just their daily life uh, use Excel in a way that can actually improve um, the, the management of their life? Okay. Um, the, you know, obvious is budget. Okay, that's that's one thing. Another thing is, say, if you've got a video collection, 
and you want to have an inventory of what you have, you can take the titles and whatever you want to categorize it by, by the, the main actors, the genre, the year it uh, the year it was released, whether you liked it or not, whether you want to, you know, want to go through and mark the ones that you want to uh, sell at the weekend garage sale, whatever, just just make a big grid and uh, put it there and then say, yeah, these are the ones I want to sell. Um, then you can sort or filter for those. Um, deciding who's going to get invited to Thanksgiving dinner, you know, and putting the names and even prioritizing and determining if we got room for 32 people and we've got a possible 50. And now maybe you make a grid and prioritize, just put everybody. Uh, I, I got a question for you. I'm going to mm -hmm. pick your brain for a second. Yes. So in, um, in the, the ADHD rewired uh, coaching and accountability group, one of the things that we did was we were kind of rotating accountability partners. And I felt so lucky because there was a member of our group that like really liked Excel and knew that it pained me to try to like figure out how to rotate it. And so what, what took me like two hours to do took her five minutes to do. So, so I, I happily allow her to take over that. Is there like is there like a formula that can be set up in Excel that can kind of automate that process? Like if each week, if you have twelve people in a group and each week you're going to have a different accountability partner, how does how does that like rotate? Because that just hurts my brain. Okay, so I did a similar challenge like that helping uh, Helena out, and so here's you ask a good you you set up the the challenge really well. And then there's the right tool, right? And I found a round robin tournament generator online. And that wound up being the best solution. I am writing that down. Yes. Um, because I did try to do that in Excel and it can be done. It got really, really involved um, because uh, there's the risk of putting somebody with themselves. Mm. Right. But in um, Excel, could I mean, is that something that, you know, if you are pretty deep into Excel, can like, you can set up an equation so that can't happen. Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can, a, um, it can definitely be done. But in that situation, it was better to say, okay, somebody has already handled the round robin tournament. That's really what you've got. Um, because you've got to deal with things. See, this is this is part of where it's, it's not linear. It really is a mind map because you have, say, 10 people and you want them with different people um, weekly. Then you have to determine, is it OK to have Rhonda with Jack? And then a few late few weeks later, Jack with Rhonda. OK. That's the kind of thing that you have to anticipate. Um, and then the weeks where Rhonda is with Rhonda. And then is there a way to then insert the variable? Um, if, cause people can decide whether or not they want to work with an accountability partner on any given week. So each week they're, they're kind of given that, that option. Do you want to work with the accountability partner? And so if mm -hmm. Anna Lucas says no, can that be inserted into the larger equation to create this kind of output of who the partners are? Yes. And um, that is one that I would rather do in Excel rather than the round robin tournament that that the that generator is not going to help with that kind of thing. Um, but you could definitely do that in Excel. And that might even be easier than trying to do the straight up round robin in Excel. Um, now, can that be done it, with like using a, like a Google um, like uh, forms where that you know, so you each week someone does a yes or no, and then um, it, it'll input that into the the Excel uh, that spreadsheet that you have already set up, and then it can kind of automate it. Because I'm all about automation, and I'm just like in, right. in all right now. The way I can just tell the way your your brain is just working, and you're looking at this as you know you're seeing the variables and you're trying to solve this this problem and mm -hmm. i'm just so grateful that there are people like you out there that will that can do this kind of stuff cuz it just mm -hmm. this just hurts my brain 
<laughs> right, right, right. Um, now, Ken, okay, so you, you mix a couple of things together. You mentioned Google, you mentioned Excel. Okay, now there is Excel online, okay, and they came late to the party. So a lot of people are deeply entrenched in Google, but let's do talk about Excel. So if you were to have something on Excel online where other people could have access to it and see it and everything, um, yes, you could set up a grid where people can be assigned various accountability partners and choose their favorites are the people definitely do not put me with this person, whatever. Yeah. You, you could set that up. Now here's one thing I say is over the years that I've been working with Excel, I always get asked, can Excel do X? And the answer has always been yes. Hmm. But then the issue is sometimes it might be a $3,000, $10,000 solution (laughs) that then the person doesn't want to pay for or or can't pay for. Um, But the answer has always been yes. And when I was working on that that, uh, rotation with Helena, yeah, I was working on a solution and I was getting close to having it done and um, realized, yeah, this is a round robin tournament. And I, I'm just thinking as on how many people listening right now are or their brains are probably just like churning through the the idea of, oh, man, I, I could use that skill set for, you know, X, Y or Z project. Mm-hmm. So now, do you work with like individuals or do you work with companies? Like, what do you, what do you do? I yeah, I work with individuals. Um, now they have to, they have to realize that, um, some, some of, uh, some people have contacted me and they think that Excel is an admin tool and that I work for $10 an hour. No, Um, you clearly use it at a whole different level. Right. Right. And, and a lot of, a lot of people don't realize the power of Excel that you can program it. I programmed it to scrape 29,000 web pages. You know, uh, you know, once I built, I will write the code and everything, then I push the button and it just runs one page at a time and retrieve this data. So Excel is quite powerful. Um, what are, but just yes. give us like a couple like quick, like cool things that people probably don't realize Excel can do that you've done with it. Yeah, like um, going on a website and retrieving data off of web pages it and then storing it in a way that's sortable. Um another thing, you can program Excel to log into your bank account and retrieve your account data and put it into your budget or whatever you need. Um I've used it to generate custom PDF forms. So a person puts in a lot of data about their business and their business goals, and then you push a button and then it generates a, your specific PDF. Uh, the Naughty Niceometer was a fun one, but it, it's very involved, you know. Um, what else? Have you ever so, developed an app? Okay, so so that's that's a couple of things you can be asking, like like a phone app, the standalone app. Mm-hmm. No, um, I've built what I call apps in Excel because people do use them for their productivity, hmm. right? Um, and Excel, uh, the the Microsoft developers of Excel, they have you know started um, Excel web app, so. I have built Excel apps that are embedded in web pages, like a um, break-even calculator where somebody can put in variables about this business and then colors change based on where you're still negative and where you're positive. Hmm. Yeah. So So I encourage people, just ask the question, can Excel do it? And then let's start thinking about it and then we can decide, okay, um, is it easy? Is it involved? Is it difficult? What do we have to anticipate? And then, you know, then you see how much it might cost. But getting back to your other question is um, I work with individuals. I work primarily with small businesses or even small departments within larger companies mm-hmm. um, to build productivity apps to help them cleanse their data um, and then training, and I'm moving more 
toward the training. And I'm going to be speaking at a conference in April. Um, What's that, the conference? So it is the, um, uh, it's a business analytics conference. It's going to be full of nerds. Hey, that's awesome. And, and yes. And, and nerds are cool. Yeah. Nerds, nerds keep your data clean. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's you right. know, and and I want everyone to really kind of take that the helicopter view of of what we're we're kind of listening to right now cuz you've been kind of going deep on on Excel and getting kind of nerdy on it, and which is awesome. But what I think we're if we really kind of think about this, you know, where is the value of this? Mm-hmm. Is that I think that one of the the many strengths of people with ADHD is that we're problem solvers. And it's so clear in, in what you do and how you do it is that you love solving problems. You're, yes. you're not, instead of someone coming to you with that problem, like, oh, I can't be done because it's never been done before. You're like, hmm, yeah. let's, let's figure out how to make that happen. And that, that's awesome. Yes, yes. Uh, it, thanks. And, and that, that's why it took me so long to realize that I had a skill versus being some guy in a cube, so, uh, in a cubicle solving all these puzzles. Yes. Um, I, I loved it. I loved it. And eventually, you know, in the last few months that I was uh, working at that job, I didn't have a title. Um, I just had you know, people calling me from all different departments asking me, can you get me this data? And see, and so here's, here's the deal is getting the data was one thing The getting accurate clean, trustworthy data was a whole different thing. Understanding what the data meant and where you need to look, you know, because there's always, can we trust this data? Okay. Have you cleaned out all the, all the uh, multiple records? Um, Does this transaction amount include taxes and shipping? Do you want that in there? Then, said, okay. Have you ever worked with anyone or thought about how to help people with digital clutter? Um, and okay, so to be sure we're talking the same thing now, what do you mean? Because when clutter? you say like duplicate files, I'm thinking about like you know, my computer and, and a lot of people have a lot of this kind of where stuff is in a lot of different places on their right. computer. Um, right. Have you ever created something that helped with that? I have not helped built something that helps with that. I have helped people clean that up. See, but can that be created? Um, I would. I'm sure that it can be. We would need to look at. I'll look at the requirements. Do you want something that would be synchronized between your your phone? your uh, email list, various spreadsheets that you've got. See, now we're talking about a process issue, right? I like and, the way your brain works. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because that, that was, that's, that's really data analysis is the process, right? Because so now we have a solution. That solution still has to happen inside a process because You can't go start up another random worksheet in some new folder and expect this new app to find it. Okay. Yeah. And I've seen situations where somebody's brought me in to talk about a solution and then I'll recognize you have a process issue because you can spend money on me building something that I've already seen these people are not going to (laughs) use. All right. Okay. Well, yeah. here's what we're gonna do. We are actually we're we're getting uh, kind of to the end end of mm. this uh, of our time here. I know okay. it goes it goes fast, right? Yeah. So you've given us a lot of really valuable information, but now it is time for the random question around. This is the part of the show that has nothing to do with ADHD, which then paradoxically has everything to do with ADHD. Right. Ozzy, you ready to do this? I'll whoop it on me. All right. All right. The the next app that's going to be developed by you, which is going to be a top bestseller that's going to revolutionize the way apps work, is called? It is called 
<laughs> what what is it okay 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 what is it called it is called knowing why you do what you do wow that's that is a that is so catchy <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, you, you you play the bass, mm-hmm. and um, I want to know if you could substitute yourself in for for any kind of bass player in, in a band. What what band would that be? Um, I would love to play bass behind Javon. He is, you know, Javon. No. Oh, okay. He is a Brazilian singer who's been around a long time. He's one of those uh, legends um, in Brazil. He can get funky. He has this falsetto that is just heavenly. Um, yeah, I'd love to play bass. They say, yeah, uh, Javon is coming to Portland. Then I'm going I'm to kick people and spit on them and everything to get that gig. <laughs> well, that's, who knows? Maybe he listens and then he, to this podcast and then, uh, you know, you could probably do some kind of Excel document to figure out the probability of that and then him calling you to, to hook up with you. Yeah. And now let's say you, you guys collaborated together and he said to you, um, we have to come up with a name for the band. What's the band name going to be? Mm. Me and Javon. Okay. Um, Sriracha Funk. Sriracha Funk, man. That's Sriracha cool. Funk. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so tell me about that. It's going to be hot. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make your tongue just pulse when you taste that music, you know, in, in your, in your, you know, it's, it's just going to make you, make you wake up and just make you feel good and all warm inside. When you hear that tight rhythm section and funky grooves, it's, it, that's it. It's Sriracha Funk. Do you yeah. think that you could send me just like a, do you have like a, a quick recording of some, uh, like a bass riff that you, that you can do that we can actually just add right to the outro of, of this podcast? Oh man, it would take me a while to find. I, um, Is your bass nearby? I don't. It's not plugged into an amp and it's not tuned up. <laughs> right. How long would that take you? Because because we can hit the uh, we can hit the edit button and, and pause the gap. It would. Uh, well, I don't have an amp. Oh, uh, my, okay. My amps are in Chicago. Man. Yeah. That's 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 rough. Yes. Yes. That's rough. Yes. It is. Yes. It is. Oof. That's, that's like having a piano with no hammers. Mm-hmm. No, it's, uh... <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. All right, well, that's do you, have another, that... do you have another question? Do I have another question? <laughs> How soon can you get an amp? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You know, I think that we are going to, uh, we're going to end that right there, Oz, because this right. has been a lot of fun. This has made my my head spin a little bit, but with more questions that I, you know, it's like, wow, I'm thinking about all the possibilities or things I can do. But I think that the the gem of, of this conversation was understanding that when you understand how your brain actually works and you find that that green zone, that, that, that area of strength where yes. work becomes play because it's fun. Man, it's it, you can do so much. You can do mm-hmm. so much, and clearly oh, you're you're a very talented and, and smart individual. And you figured out that there are just some things that you're just not cut out to do. Like I'm not cut out to do anything harder than Excel. And thank <laughs> goodness for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Oz, um, tell us one more time of kind of where where we can reach you. And do you have are there any kind of final words that you want to leave us with? Okay. Um, yep, you can find me at datascopic.net. Um, I am Oz underscore dragon cookie on Twitter. Um, that's a story, but for another time, um, after we say goodbye, you're going to tell me that story so we can have it on the video. Okay. All right. Sure. Um, and you know, 
Oh, any any final words is um, yeah, ADHD. You know, it's it's a real thing, and I feel blessed to have it, and feel blessed to have uh, been diagnosed with it, and um, just own it and work with it. Oz, thank you so much. If uh, if you want to uh, go back and check the show notes for this episode, just go to my website, erictivers.com, and he will be somewhere in the episode 40-something or another. I haven't planned that far ahead, but uh, just find, look for Oz, and you will find him. All Oz, right. thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Well, ADHD Rewired Community. Thanks again for listening and for leaving those ratings and reviews on Stitcher and iTunes. They are always helpful and always appreciated. Now, are you ready for the shortest outro in the history of this podcast? Here we go. This is the last time you're going to hear me say this. This is your last chance to register for the ADHD Rewired Coaching and Accountability Group. Three months of coaching, five days a week with the power of of accountability partners plan it share it get it done go to adhdrewired.com and prepare to get your adhd rewired until next time